Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Over the last two years, we've seen about 30 Starlink launches, carrying a total of over 1,700 satellites into low Earth orbit. And by the end of June, SpaceX had finished launching all the satellites required to bring the Starlink constellation to full functionality. But users of Starlink aren't getting full functionality from the network just yet because it actually takes a few months for Starlink satellites to go from their initial injection orbits to their final orbit. And I kind of want to talk about this whole process because it's, it's kind of fascinating the different tricks they use to distribute the satellites into their final orbits and how these final orbits are arranged. So this is the orbit viewer from celestrack.com and every single dot here represents a Starlink satellite. Now most of these are in their final orbits and if you look at them you can sort of see these vertical lines running up and down and they more or less alternate with one group going up and then adjacent group going down and so on and so forth. And you might be inclined to think of these sort of regular spacings as orbital planes, but actually the orbits are all moving on a 53 degree inclination. So now you can see this one Starlink satellite uh, selected. And if you look on that green line, you can see another one which is just crossing the coast of, coast of Africa. And there's another one coming up. So these inclined angles, those represent the different orbital planes. And it becomes much more obvious when I use this diagram, which I created using a script of my own and some Python. Uh, and what you're seeing here is the lines showing the orbits, and they are changing over time in this case. It, in this diagram, by the way, the camera is fixed. What we're actually doing is we're running times, time forward. Uh, you'll notice that we're doing like a couple of days every second. Well, these orbits are being pulled around by Earth's equatorial bulge, right? Again, this is fat Earth theory. At Starlink's operational altitude, the Earth's shape causes the orbits to precess around at a rate of about four and a half degrees per day. So when it's fully deployed, we expect to have 72 orbital planes, with each of them separated by five degrees at the equator. And each plane will contain uh, about 22 satellites distributed around each uh, around the orbit. And so this diagram from Starlink.sx gives you a better idea of what uh, the situation is with regard to the planes. Uh, what we've got now is we've, we've changed the coordinates up. Along the bottom, you have the angle relative to like a start point where the orbit plane crosses the equator. And the second one, this, the vertical axis, is how far along that orbit is at a, the satellite is at a specific time. And so you see these nice vertical lines with, you know, about 20 satellites in each of these planes. And then there's a few which are missing right now. So generally the Starlink launches have carried about 60 satellites. Some have carried fewer because they have ride share, but the way they're deployed is in one big batch. In fact, the whole spacecraft just rotates around horizontally. And at one point they just let the clamps go and these things fly off like sort of scattering a pack of cards around the room. They're not coordinated, they're not carefully ejected like you see with uh, other satellite constellations. The satellites bump up against each other, they come out with random speeds, and then from there they have the job of getting to their final orbit. So yeah, the satellites themselves are about 260 kilograms in mass. They're flat packed, they have solar panels, they have all the antenna, they have a little uh, ion engine in there, a Hall effect thruster fueled by Krypton gas. And I find the decision to use Krypton uh, a fascinating example of how SpaceX has tried to make these things uh, as low cost, as affordable as possible. Normally with a Hall effect thruster, you would use xenon gas because for the same amount of electrical power, you are going to get much more thrust. But you're also going to pay more than 10 times the price to get Xenon over Krypton. And in fact, when you're talking about tens of thousands of satellites, that's a serious part of the world market for Xenon. So we'd probably push the price even higher if they wanted to do that. So the fact that they're working with Krypton is you know, critical. Anyway, those thrusters will be very important in bringing the satellites up to their final orbit, but there's other tricks that they have to use to make sure that they get separated into their different orbital planes. So first thing is, that as soon as they're released, they're all sort of randomly floating there in space. And as 
they go at orbit, they will get spread out just due to having slightly different orbits. And there's a bit of randomization that goes on in the sort of chaotic deployment process. You know, it actually takes them a while to figure out which one is which so that they can start giving them commands in the certainty that they aren't going to crash into each other when they start unfolding their antenna and you know trying to move. Now, once the engines start up and the satellites begin to manoeuvre, the first thing they do is raise their orbits from the initial insertion orbit, which is below 300 kilometres, and bring them to a sort of temporary parking orbit between about 350, 400 kilometres. And they will spend some time there before then finally boosting up to about 550 kilometres, which is their final uh, you know, operational orbit. And satellites from the same launch will spend different amounts of time in that temporary parking orbit before proceeding to their final operational orbit. Some will go straight there, typically about 20 from each launch of 60. Then the ones that remain in the lower orbit, because they are closer to the Earth, they get bigger effects due to the oblateness of the Earth and their orbits twist around faster. So you can see this, the lower orbit is getting pulled around faster and therefore it is being split into separate planes by choosing when they want to fire their engines to bring them up to their operational orbit. So this is how you get multiple satellites from a single launch into different orbital planes. Normally, uh, orbital plane changes are very expensive in terms of propellant. To go from one plane to the next takes about uh, 500 meters per second of delta V at these altitudes. To raise the orbit takes about 170. So this is three times more expensive to do this using propellant. But if you can use the Earth's gravity and you can afford to wait that amount of time, then you can do it more efficiently. Another thing to notice, by the way, there's some rogue objects which, after going up, they start to fall back down into lower orbits. Those are sometimes satellites which have had some problem and they're bringing them back down to either test them or sometimes dispose of them in the atmosphere. And over the last two years of Starlink deployment, they've uh, disposed of about 5% of their satellites. So this is like a whole animation showing all the launches and finishing in June of this year. Uh, this is the very first batch that was launched in 2019. M most of these are no longer operational. They were not the final version. Uh, they didn't have the same capabilities. But you see now uh, in 2020, they really start launching these in large amounts. Also note that the orbits are supposed to be somewhat colour-coded. They're supposed to be red when they're close to the Earth and green when they're in their final orbit. The active number here is totally a guess. I didn't actually have anything beyond taking their altitude and saying that they were above 500 kilometres. So that's not a perfect number, but it's a pretty good estimate. And again, I have to make it clear that I've exaggerated the height differences here so you can see the orbit raising and lowering. In reality, the Earth is like 6,400 kilometers in radius and the satellites don't get 600 kilometers above the surface, so it would be like 10% of this radius in real life. It's also worth noting the satellites that are in polar orbit from the rideshare missions, those do the same thing. They end up spreading themselves around. So if you look at all the satellites from a typical launch, this is what the height versus time graph. Again, thanks to Jonathan McDowell, who's been tracking this. He's a great person to follow for all satellite operations. So you can see the satellites going up to their 380 kilometer mark, and then they sit there. Some of them go straight to a, uh, their final orbit. Some of them wait a while and go up to different orbital planes. But now, as the orbits have been getting filled in with about 20 from each launch, the later launches have had to spend more time moving their satellites around to hit the planes that they want and possibly just have single satellites go up to fill in gaps that have been found or resulted from failed satellites. Now that covers separation of the satellites into their different orbital planes, but moving or distributing the satellites along a specific orbital plane uniformly, that's interesting to look at as well. So this is an animation by Elias Eckley. I found it posted on the NASA Space Flight Forums. So again, along the horizontal axis, you've got the longitude of the ascending node, which is pretty much, you know, where the satellites cross the equator relative to the stars. And on the vertical axis, you've got the angle along the orbit. And one important thing is that these are at different altitudes. Now, there is an altitude scale on the right here, but it's actually just easier to look and see that the ones moving fast downwards are in lower orbits because they're, you know, this is relative to the target you know, parking orbit. 
So what we see here is we've got one group that are more or less now fixed and distributed along their orbit, but they start out in their parking orbits in a tight little bundle, and only when they begin to raise their orbit do they begin to spread out towards their target orbit and then very carefully you know, move until they reach their final location. So the fact that these ones remain very close together during this parking uh, time, that is intentional. That couldn't happen by accident. If they were uncontrolled, they would spread out much more rapidly. So I'm, I don't know why they do this. It probably, maybe it makes it easier for them to control them or check them out or just it, it makes the math easier. But yeah, these that is how they end up getting moved into their final uh, distribution along the orbits. If you look carefully, you can also see a few objects which are moving upwards. And those ones are in higher orbits. And so, again, because of fat Earth theory, they are processing relative to the others, but they're doing it more slowly. So those are ones which took a little longer to reach the final uh, operational orbit. And because of that, they have moved a little too far westwards. So by moving into a higher orbit, they move eastwards until they get in line with all the others. And then they can finally take their spot in the uh, formation. SpaceX aren't the only company launching a mega constellation for communication. OneWeb is also doing this, and they do pretty much similar things. They launch to initial higher orbits. They use the Soyuz and they have fewer satellites per launch, but they also have much higher operational orbits, so it takes them a fair amount of time to reach out to those as well. OneWeb are, of course, still in the process of launching their constellation. The final constellation should have over 600 satellites in it, and they've launched about one third of that. They don't need as many satellites as Starlink because they are at higher orbits, and therefore each satellite can see a much larger area of the Earth. So anyway, I hope you see now that it's not just about launching satellites into orbit, but the subsequent delicate dance of orbital mechanics that puts the satellites in the locations, in the orbits where they need to be to perform their job. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.